first guitar, that's a story in itself. Uh, the first guitar I got to play really, I remember, was a white Rosetti that my brother's girlfriend, her brother had, and I, I think Stephen borrowed it for a little while. It's his artwork that you see on the page, you know, that lovely piece of artwork that you see that's over there, that's, uh, that was done by Stephen. Anyway, Stephen borrowed it for a while and I had a few goes on it trying to play um, the young ones and things like that. And it looks a bit like something Roy Orbison would play. A few years passed and I'd been watching things develop and I'd, uh, I'd been watching rock and roll because Stephen really liked rock and roll. And when I went to the big school, when I went to Severian, I used to sing um, in the opera because my mum had sung in Russian to me uh, when I was little and it kind of probably captivated me enough to want to do that. So I'd been doing it for about three years and then the third year, I didn't, the fourth year, I didn't get a part. You know, and I'd sung Suzanne in the Marriage of Figaro, I'd sung Giannetta in the Gondoliers, which were, which were female roles basically. And it was great at Severian because the headmaster, Brother Cyril, uh, allowed me to grow my hair while I was in the opera so I could kind of, you know, fill out the part even more, you know. And then of course, on the last day of the, uh, the final, which was a Saturday night, Brother Cyril would come up onto stage and thank us all and thank the orchestra. We had a proper orchestra, like 58 musicians, which was fantastic. In the school gym and all the audience was there and everything. So, right. so, so thanks very much and see you all next year. And George, get your hair cut on Monday. So that was how it used to finish. But I had that as a bit of license. Anyway, on the fourth year, or yeah, fourth year, I don't get a part. I don't get invited to take part at all. And of course, what? What's, what's going on? Why have we got a part? And I just, I think I'd seen Beatles on, on the television. I said to my dad, can I have a guitar? I'd like a guitar. And he was really monosyllabic, my dad, you know, working really hard, 197 hours a week. I mean, I know I'm exaggerating, but he seemed to be working every single minute. And I, I remember he always used to have soup first before he ate his tea and that's because he was in a, a pogrom, he was in Siberia taken by the Russians in the Second World War and they used to get gruel so we always used to have soup and I said look dad I'd really like guitar you know I'd really like guitar and he looked up from his seat and said yes okay and I was really shocked because <laughs> it was like generally blood out of the stone with dad he was monosyllabic what I realised was, of course, while I was growing up, in our front room there were two gas fittings for the old gas bulbs that they used to have in the, you know, in the 20s. And hanging on one of those was a mandolin. And Dad had picked that mandolin up in Naples and carried it while he was in the 8th Army up through Italy and Monte Cassino and all these things that he must have witnessed. And every now and again when he wasn't working on a Sunday, he would go into the front room and he'd get the mandolin down and he'd tune it up and just play for a few minutes and I'd hang it up again. You know, and he really liked to hear us all singing at Christmas time and stuff. Anyway, he came home from work on the Saturday, went upstairs, got changed, that was working clothes, came down in his suit and a hat and off we went on the bus to Manchester to Oxford Road where all the music shops were. And then there was, there was Barrett's and Reno's and, uh, oh, what's the other one called? Mammy Logs. And for the next three and a half, four hours, my dad tried every single acoustic guitar in all the shops. I mean, when I say every one, I mean, in those days, they didn't have hundreds of guitars in the shops, like they are now. But he tried all these acoustic guitars, listened to them very carefully, and I was like, you know, because I've got my mindset on a 0321, a Japanese electric guitar, because of course all the bands were playing electric guitars. I didn't see anybody on acoustic, so, you know, so we were walking along, we'd go off to Mammy Locks, do the 35 guitars there, over to Reno's, do 45 guitars there. I'm stood in the corner, really, you know, and dad's Anyway, about 20 past five at Mammy Locks, he bought an Echo acoustic guitar, a lovely thing. So they put it in the case, my dad paid the money over, 
and we walked back to, up Oxford Road to where we used to get the bus to Stretford and it used to be like there used to be a cinema on the corner there, uh, the Oxford. So I waited on the bus stop which of course Johnny Glum. <laughs> so we drove home, walked around the corner from Whole Source in Stretford, walked onto Cecil Road, walked in the house, put the guitar in the corner, went and watched the telly. About two weeks later my brother said to me, Stephen said, why aren't you playing the guitar? I said, because my dad bought me an acoustic and I wanted an electric like the Beatles have got and The Who and all these people that I really have been watching on Ready Steady Go. Stephen was quiet for a minute and uh, said, uh, how much was the guitar, George? So I said, uh, eight pounds, 10 shillings. He said, do you know how much your dad earns every week? I said, no. He says, Ten pounds, ten shillings a week. He's got enough faith in the that you might possibly play the guitar to spend eighty percent of his own earnings. He's paying five pounds a month for a mortgage, and he's prepared to spend eight pounds ten shillings on a guitar for you. A moment inside. From that day on, I got the guitar and I've played it ever since. And I had that guitar for about two years till I was about. 16, I used to take it down to Stoke-on-Trent when I used to go and see my godmother and her son who with whom I was friends. So we go to the park, Trentham Gardens, and there'd be a few girls playing tennis, so I'd get the guitar out, thinking I was like, very cool. I wasn't. I could play Catch the Wind or something like that. One day we were in the garage that was by Kenny's house, and that's where we, all the young people used to meet. Kenny had some friends, there's Peepsy and uh, Colin Carter, who were later would sing in a couple of bands with and I put the guitar down and in comes another lad and not seeing it on the floor walks in it was a sliding door walks in straight on the neck takes a headstock off the guitar you can imagine it was a change of clothing where I was because I knew how my dad would and of course it's eight pounds ten shillings of guitar I don't know how we got around to I think the band we all clubbed together and uh, I ended up with a Future Armour 2. Now if any of you know what that guitar is, it's um, a lovely mauve, almost purple colour with cream finger plate. I'm not really a guitar collector, I'm not really one of those people who can tell you what the weight the strings are, whether it's got this kind of nut or... I just played the thing. But I remember that it was, had a really, really, really nice neck. Very used to play things like Not Fade Away and uh, making Time, which if you don't know that song, you should go and check it out by a band called Creation. And I think it's the first time that somebody played a guitar with a, with a violin bow. And at this point, we had a manager and we were like, I think the, the drummer and the bass player were 16 and I was 15. We used to play at Round Trees and Round Trees, there was a circuit of four places. There was Top of the Town, Round Trees Sound, Spring Gardens and I uh, can't remember the fourth one. So perhaps if somebody knows you can send me a message saying what the fourth place was. I've got enough attendance in there, haven't I? Again. So I'm playing this for a while and for some reason I'd seen this Burns Trisonic somewhere. And I think we traded in the Future Armour for a Burns Trisonic. It's a three pickup, it was a Burns made by Carl Burns and it was his kind of English version I think of the Stratocaster which of course was completely out of our out of our reach but I'd had managed to save up enough money to get terms to buy an AC30 so together with that Burns Trisonic I was starting to write songs so I'd write things like Linda's Just a Statue and Heart for Hire and a few but the, the band didn't really want to play they wanted to play Purple Haze and uh, give me some loving and all these things. So I was getting really frustrated and at one point they both left and joined another band without telling me. So I turned up for rehearsal and they're not there. And don't know what's happened. And I think they joined the other band because there was a keyboard player and they were going to do all these soul things. But I found out and I was really, really, my heart was in playing. I was really enjoying it, which is why I play. So one night at Roundtree's top of the town, I was so frustrated and I got, 
I've been seeing Pete Townsend breaking guitars on either the o at the Oasis or the Jigsaw or wherever else we went to see them. I broke the guitar, took the head off. And at the moment of doing it, I was absolutely... I realised what I'd done. And it was in... And Stephen, if you look at his artwork there, he covered the entire guitar front and hand painted all images very similar to that so it looked really psychedelic and stuff. So I felt even worse. All that remained after that debacle of the night was a Burns Trisonic pickup that I'd managed to take out of the guitar. And that Burns Trisonic is in that guitar there which was rebuilt for me in 1975 by a guy called Chris Daniel. In 24 hours Chris Daniel built that guitar for £18. It was originally going to be a jazz bass. Chris had a precision and he was building himself a jazz bass copy out of plywood. It's three pieces of five inch plywood. It's not this isn't the original neck. We went to Gordon Smith and got a reject neck which had a crack here where they're putting a truss rod in and we got it for two ream of paper. These cost 18 pence each. It's the original guitar, 18 pounds, the original paintwork. And the first song I wrote on this was a song called Low Profile. So to finish off for that story because I've gone up a bit. If it's still in tune, I'd like to play. natural kind of reverb even when it wasn't plugged in and what it did is it had it had a bounce to it that uh, I'd not experienced with a guitar before and I was really wanting to play things that were fast you know not long after this is going to come who is innocent and a few other things but at this point in time So I found that the keystone to this song was a, a line called Low Profile Descending Stairs. And what prompted me was that I'd, I'd been watching an artist playing one of the bands in Manchester and he made this declaration, he left the band, he left the band and decided that uh, I don't want anything to do with music because it's all false, it's all unreal, it's like it's all shorter. I think it's not what we're supposed to be about doing all this kind of music. And then like two or three weeks later he's on the front page of every music paper in his new band. I was just kind of interested that people could just make stuff up to launch their own careers. And that was not what I kind of thought was a, the way of doing it. But fair play to him. happening musically there was all sorts of new bands coming along Sex Pistols were here the Ramones were over here I found it very exciting because I found it very much like rock and roll and this guitar for some reason 
encouraged me in becoming part of the writing process of all the songs and maybe made me a better player. It's, uh, it's still my favourite guitar. <laughs>